We're going to be turning to the Scriptures this morning and turning to the book of Acts. I encourage you to have your Bible with you because we're going to be traversing a few different Scriptures as we seek to answer the question, why baptize children? Why do we baptize children? <clears throat> now, I, could, I suppose I could just say, because the Bible tells us to, and then we could sit down and be done with it for the day, but, but that wouldn't be a sufficient answer. And it would be a very short sermon. But we're going to be turning to the book of Acts, and we're going to start in chapter 2. Start in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read from verse 37 through to 39. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 39. This is God's holy and infallible word for you this morning. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word to our hearts and souls that we might know him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of having your word. We thank you that you've not left us without a witness without a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we just pray, Father, that now as we come to consider it, as we turn to it, as we sit under the preaching of your word, that you would give us hearts and minds that are ready to listen and receive. Give us eyes to see wonderful things in your word, O God. Lord, we recognize that without the illumination of your Holy Spirit, unless your Spirit gives light, we will not benefit from it. And so we do pray, Holy Spirit of the living God, would you work, work through the word, work in our hearts, make our hearts good soil, ready to receive your word and plant it deep inside of us. Lord, we pray that as we think about your work throughout history, that you would help us to see your immense grace and your love for your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you're a person that's been coming to the membership classes, you're going to get a refresher because we just went through this in our membership class as to why we baptize children. So you get a bonus double dip. But for everybody else, it's been a couple of years since we've actually considered this question. Why is it we do what we do? It's interesting, isn't it? Because for every Christian church, baptism is important. We all passionately love baptism and believe it's vital. I can bear testimony to this in a number of different ways. And one is just recently I was in a pastor's group having a discussion and I, I raised a question about baptism and all of a sudden everyone got very excited to share their perspectives in a very lovely and friendly way, of course. But it was like everyone was very excited to say what they thought about it because it's just so important to us. This came home to me one day when I was studying at Bible college my first year at a very, it was a very Pentecostal Bible college and Baptistic. I was very weird because I was neither. And, and yet there I found myself around the lunch table one day enjoying a meal. And the caretaker, who was becoming a good friend of mine, his wife was sitting opposite me at the table. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she had been silent the whole meal. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, she sticks her finger across the table and goes, You people baptize your children! I was like, whoa, I didn't even know what to say. I was so caught off guard, and I didn't even have a response. But at that moment, I walked out, and I thought to myself, why did I baptize my children? And to be totally honest, I couldn't give a really good answer other than 
that's what we do. And maybe some of you find yourself in that situation today where you've baptized your children or you would baptize children if you had them and you think to yourself, well, that's just what we've always done. It's what my parents did and it's what my grandparents did. It's what all Presbyterians do, isn't it? It's what's always happened, isn't it? And, and although that's, that's one way of proceeding through life, it's actually really important to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it why it is that we as Presbyterians sprinkle our babies. And so in order to understand that, I want us to launch off from Acts chapter 2, and then we're kind of going to go to the Old Testament and then come back to the New Testament again and try and bring it all together. Firstly, just notice these words in Acts chapter 2 and what they're set in. So we, we find these three verses set in what we call Peter's sermon. So he stands up in verse 14 and begins his sermon. And this, the purpose of the sermon is to explain why Jesus Christ has poured out his spirit upon his people in this way at this time. And, and as he's preaching through his sermon, the people begin to feel rebuked. The people begin to feel guilty of their sin. And it's not surprising after words like verse 23, 22 and 23, men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Pretty damning words, aren't they? You killed the Son of God. You murdered him. And, and, and so through the sermon, they're beginning to become convicted by the weight of what they've done. And it culminates in verse 37, where they are cut to the heart. If you're wondering what that means, it means the Spirit of God has pierced their heart, has caused their heart to feel pain and go, what have we done? We all know that feeling, don't we, when we've been snapped doing something wrong. And someone confronts us and we go, oh, oh, I can't believe I did that. I'm so sorry. That's the experience going on right now. And they cry out in verse 37, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? We killed the Lord of glory. We killed Jesus. What are we going to do about it? And Peter tells them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And of course, it's verse 39 we're most interested with. This promise, the promise, is for you and your children, and for those who are far off, and their children too, and for everyone who the Lord will call. So what is the promise? You see, the, the word promise could link to a number of different things in the preceding verse, couldn't it? it? It could be speaking about the forgiveness of sins. It could be speaking about repentance or being baptized, or it could maybe speak about the gift of the Spirit. What is this promise that, that Peter sees being fulfilled right now in this very moment? You see, Peter preaches the sermon, he hears the repentance, and then he says, this promise is for you. Well, what promise is he thinking about? There's lots of promises in the Old Testament. And to understand that, we have to go back to the great forefather, Abraham. We sung of him earlier. Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them, and I trust, Lord willing, so are you. But we need to turn to Genesis Chapter 12, Genesis chapter 12, and there's, there's four particular references I want us to quickly look at through the Genesis story. We remember Genesis 1 through 11 has been very fast, covering thousands and thousands of years of history as we go through all the generations leading up to Abraham. And all of a sudden, in chapter 12, history stops. <laughs> 
from a biblical point of view. It's like someone puts the handbrake on and the camera gets zoomed right in on this one particular person. Up till now, God has been working through many different people in many different ways, but now God comes to one man, one man and his wife called Abram. So chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here the promise begins. In verse 2, I will make you a nation, I will bless you, I will give you a name, and I will make it so that you are a blessing to others. That through you, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. But is this promise just for Abraham? Is this promise just for Abraham or Abraham and Sarah? Well, have a look at chapter 12, sorry, 13, chapter 13. Verse 14, the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, and I will give it to you. So God gives the promise to Abram, I will give you a land. He takes him towards the land, and he says, I'll give it to you and your offspring. The promise is being extended to Abram and his offspring. Then we get to chapter 17 in the story of Abraham, and God comes to him again. In verse 9 to 14, we read these words. I Actually, we'll start at verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so now as God continues to unveil and reveal his covenantal working with Abraham, we go from a promise of a land to a promise of a land to him and his offspring, to now a promise to him and his offspring, a land of their sojournings with a sign and seal to go with it and with a covenant to go with it, a covenantal agreement that I will be your God and you will be my people. And he says, and the sign of that mark is circumcision. And so for every single male born or bought Within the people of God, every time they went to the restroom, they knew what? That they were a part of God's people. It was a constant visual reminder that they were God's special people. And that God was cutting 
a covenant with them in their very flesh. And then we see it worked out. So we we won't read through it, but the, the family then gets taken aside. Abram takes all of his all of his male servants. He takes Ishmael his son at 13, and he takes all the other boys in his household and circumcises all of them, including himself. We won't go into the details. But the covenant is cut, and the agreement is made, and they are permanently joined together in this fashion to God under God's promises. And then when you get to Isaac, guess what Abraham does the second Isaac's born? He circumcises him because he is one of the offspring of Abraham. He is the child of God's choosing. And so what what this is all pointing to, of course, is the way God works. God, by his grace, doesn't just extend grace to Abram, does he? He doesn't just say, Abram, I'm going to work with you and I'm going to save you. But he says, I'm going to work with you and I'm going to work with your family. Sarah enters into the blessing of God's grace because she is part of the family of Abraham. And likewise, for Isaac and for Rachel and for Jacob and for all of the other descendants following the line of God's faithful people, generation after generation after generation. And it is this promise that Peter is thinking of. How do I know that? How do I know that this is the promise that he's thinking of? Well, it's it's because this is the promise that undergirds the entirety of God's people. This is the thing that everything else is built upon. This is the foundation block for Israel that they looked back to. It was always about the promise made to Abraham. And they saw that fulfilled when they enter the promised land after leading Egypt, don't they? They come out of Egypt, he takes them into the promised land, and God says to them, to Joshua, this is the land that I promised to Abraham, and I'm bringing you into it. I am keeping my promise to Abraham and his offspring. And so the children were receiving the blessing, not not just one part of the people of Israel, but every single one of them was entering into the blessing of the promise. But there's another way we know that this is exactly what Peter was thinking, and that's because Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, enables us to understand what's actually going on here. It's not just about the land of Israel. It's not just about obtaining Jerusalem. Or a kingdom. It's about something far greater. So turn to Galatians with me. The letter to the Galatians by Paul and chapter 3. Chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 7 through 9. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So in in Paul's mind, when God comes and makes this promise with Abraham, he is declaring the gospel to him. And it's to him and his offspring. It's not just to Abraham is the promise. No, it's to him and his offspring. So God declares the gospel to Abraham and his descendants after him from generation to generation. Then Paul goes on to explain Further into this promise in verse 12, sorry, 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Christ. 
Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And then verse 29, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Do you see how this is all flowing naturally together? There's a promise and a blessing given to Abraham. And God says, it's for you and your children. And then Paul, looking back at it, he says, that promise, that blessing was the coming of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't say, but now it's been changed for only adults and those who believe. He doesn't say that, does he? No, he just takes the same wording and carries on trucking forward. And every single Jew who read Galatians would assume that that promise is for them and their offspring after them. So what was given to Abraham? A promise. A promise of redemption and the promise of the Holy Spirit. God gave him a sign and a seal to go with that circumcision. So God makes a covenantal promise to Abraham to be his God and that they would be his people. And it's all based off the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. You see, everything happening to Abraham is happening because Jesus Christ is coming. That Jesus doesn't come in the way he comes because Abraham received a promise. Rather, Jesus was coming. So Abraham received the promise that made sense in light of the coming of Jesus Christ. We read from Christ backwards into the Old Testament in order to understand things like the promises and the blessings of Abraham. And so when, when they cry out, if you go back to Acts with me now, when they cry out to Paul, what shall we do? Understanding this promise explains exactly why Peter says, repent and be baptized because the promise is for you and your children. It's not just for you. And you've got to remember, this is a crowd of 3,000 people. This 3,000 people will include women and children. And, and some people will say, yeah, but it doesn't say that the children must repent. It also doesn't say that the women in the group should repent. But it's a fairly safe assumption that he's addressing not just the males, isn't it? And it's a fairly safe assumption that he is addressing the entire families that are gathered before them, all the people of God, and he's saying, come, repent and be baptized because the promises of God's favor and grace to save a people for himself is offered to you and your families as well. And now before we move on, the question needs to be asked. The question must be asked, have you responded? You see, it means nothing if you come in here and leave with a good understanding of pedo-baptism if you have not tasted of redemption. It means nothing. If, if you've come here this morning and you've just strolled through the door and you're wondering why on earth you're sitting in church, well, good on you for coming to church, but it's kind of pointless if you miss out on the fact that what Peter is calling you to do, first and foremost, is to repent and believe. You must come to Christ. And not later, not tomorrow, not next week, today, because today is the day of salvation. We don't know if there will be a, another day. We don't know how long God will hold forth his mercy and grace to a people who will not repent. Will you repent? The Spirit of God says, come. Will you come? Because he offers you life. He offers you all the promises of Abraham. He says, I'll be your God. I will be your God. And you will be my child. And I will be there for you. 
And I will walk with you and I will talk with you along life's weary way. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him? Is he yours? Have you been cut to the heart by the Spirit of God? Have you turned and found salvation? If not, now is the chance. You don't know if you're going to have another chance, but now is the chance. And you might say, what do I do? What do I do? You repent, you turn from your ways, and you turn to God, and He will forgive you. He will wash you clean of all unrighteousness. You must be born again, Jesus says. You must be born again, and the Spirit of the living God will do that in your heart. You might say, what do I do? Cry out to Him for mercy. You don't have to do, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to go into a special room. No one's going to hound you. You just cry out in your heart, Jesus Christ, save me. I long to be set free from the shackles of sin and death. I long to enter into the promises of Abraham. It's yours for the taking. Will you have it today? Will you have it? Well, this, this promise came with a sign and a seal, we remember and, and you might be fair to ask at this point, well, let, let's think about it. If, if Paul is thinking about bapti- uh, not baptism, if Paul is thinking about the promise and, and he's seeing the fulfillment of the promise and the sign and the seal with the promise was circumcision, how come we're not doing circumcision? Because wouldn't that make sense? The same promise, same blessing, same sign. That makes sense, doesn't it? Why don't we just carry on doing circumcision? Don't worry, I'm not going to suggest we do that. What's going on? Why does it change from circumcision to baptism? Well, there's a few different reasons. One is that the the sign, as I said earlier, the bloody sign of circumcision is no longer needed. We remember that everything in the Old Testament was pointing towards Christ, right? And that in the Old Testament, we had bloody signs because the bloody signs were all pointing to the fact that a Savior was coming who would shed his blood. They were what we call types or shadows of the real thing. The real thing being Christ who would shed his blood. The other reason we don't need circumcision is that circumcision was a sign that sin had to be cut off from us. Well, Christ, in our union with Christ, we enter into the reality of being cut off. We don't need to be cut off. We don't need sin cut off because we enter into the circumcision of Christ by our union with him in baptism. That's what Paul says in Colossians 2. We don't need it because what we need is to be washed in what Christ has done, provided us with blood. Christ has given us the blood, and all we need to do is enter into that blood and be washed. Hence, the sign of cutting off has been replaced with the washing by water because we no longer need it. But the most clear reason is that's exactly what Jesus commanded, isn't it? The Great Commission. Go, teach, baptize. That's that's the new mark, Jesus says. That's the sign that people are my disciples, that they receive baptism. So who does it get given to then? If, If the sign has changed to baptism... Who does it get given to? Well, we remember this language of offspring. Everything's a continuation from Abraham. It obviously gets given to the children. And and there's another way of thinking about this. And and you've got to ask yourself, when, when the Jews are sitting there at Pentecost, okay, it's Acts 2, Pentecost Day, all Jews in the crowd, basically, 
And, and Peter says, the promise is for you and for your children. The, the sign of the covenant is baptism, and it's for you and your offspring. What conclusion does a Jew come to? You just reverse your history all the way back to Abraham. For a couple of thousands of years, every single Jewish boy has received circumcision at eight days old. If they weren't, they were cut off from God's people as rebellious and wicked. And so year after year after year after year, they're seeing children enter into the covenant over and over and over again. You get to Jesus... Jesus is circumcised on the eighth day. Jesus dies and is raised from the dead. Peter stands up and says, the promise is for you. Now, what would make a Jewish dad at that point say, well, clearly, I don't baptize my children. No one arrives at that conclusion, do they? It just no one ever arrives at that conclusion in that moment. You would need, you would need God to say, by the way, the the promise has changed a bit. Like the promise is still the same, but the sign and seal is now for adults and believing adults only. It's not for your children. Like as a Jew, you would need that because any time God changes the way he works. He always tells us. God is consistent in the way he works all the way through Scripture. Another way of thinking about this is the fact that God God makes covenants with individuals, doesn't he? Okay, So God makes a covenant with Adam and Eve. God makes a covenant with Noah. God makes a covenant with Abraham. God makes a covenant with Moses. God makes a covenant with David. God makes a covenant with Phinehas. On and on and on. Individuals. But without exception, there is not a covenant in the Bible that is individualistic. Do you understand the difference between those two things? He makes a promise with Moses, but it extends to the people. He makes a promise with David, which descends to Jesus, and on and on and on again. You will never find an example in the Bible where God does something differently. And the new covenant in the New Testament is no different. God works with these individual people and those after them. Because the period of the New Testament, after the coming of Christ, is a period of greater grace, not a period of lesser grace. You see in the Old Testament who got welcomed to receive the sign and the seal. Only males. Sorry, ladies. You all got excluded. You were part of the covenant, but you never got the joy of receiving the sign of the covenant. It was only males that could look and say, I've received it. And yet now in the greater period of grace, that sign gets extended to the women as well. And so not just our baby sons, but our baby daughters have the joy of going through their life and saying, I am am a baptized child of God because God is a God who works with parents and children alike. So what does this, what does this all mean for you and I? What, what does this mean for Scott and Sarah? I mean, it's all fine to get our kids baptized, but what does it actually mean for them? Well, it, it means God welcomes sinners both us and our children. There's something profoundly bizarre about a baptism which is so unbelievably unlike the world because the world tells us babies are beautiful and innocent. Don't they? 
We're just innocent little kiddies. Every time we baptize a child, we declare that this child is a filthy sinner who deserves nothing but the wrath of God. But the wonderful thing is it doesn't just point to the sinfulness of our children, does it? It points to the grace of God who would call our children in the same way he would call us. By promises. You see, that the baptism of, of Robbie that we had a few weeks ago is no different than the baptism we just had. Because they both come in promise form. Robbie hasn't entered into the fullness of salvation, has he? He's still awaiting that day, just like Edward. The salvation is not fully realized. It is in seed form, in promise form, awaiting the final day of redemption. But by God's grace, by faith alone, in Christ alone, we enter into salvation and that uncleanness is washed away. It also reminds us that God pours out his covenantal grace upon us and our children. God is a gracious God and loves to bestow it upon us. It reminds us, as 1 Corinthians tells us, that not only us, but our children are holy to the Lord, set apart for his purposes. It reminds us that God is our Father. Why is it? that we say to our children, come on, son, come on, daughter, let's learn the Lord's Prayer. And what do we pray with them? Our Father. They don't pray Dad's Father, do they? They pray our Father because He is the Father of your children. Let that be a reminder to you, parents. God is a jealous God, and he passionately loves his children more than you do, and he will defend them, he will protect them, he will love them, he will care for them, and he will, he will fight for them. I think of Dee this morning while we all sit here, Dee's sitting in hospital, with her ear machine strapped to her. She doesn't know how long she's going to be there. And Ryan's probably sitting there, and they're probably both listening to us right now. Hi. And yet, you know the wonderful thing? We've got a Father in heaven who cares for them. We've got a Father who's sitting there the whole time going, it's okay, I've got this. I've got this. I love this kid more than you do. I love this kid and I love this family way more than the church does. And I will fight for them. And I will be with them. Because this is our God. You remember the, all through the Old Testament, people of Israel are in trouble. They cry out to God. And God sends rocks and hailstones on people. God's people are in trouble. And God steps in and annihilates entire peoples for his appointed and chosen people. And he continues to do that today. We are safe and secure in the loving Father's arms. And so every time we think of our baptism, whether you were baptized as a child or an adult, every time you can think back to this and think, my Father in heaven loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Oh, how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should send his only son to make a wretch a treasure. That's what we confess in this. It's what we do in this. Because the covenant of God's grace highlights his immense mercy and kindness to us sinners. Who are we? Who are we that he would be mindful of us? 
Who are we that he would be mindful of our children? Can you just comprehend that? Born wretches, and yet he loves us. What a privilege, brothers and sisters. What a joy. What an immense privilege to enter into the grace of a God like that. Indeed, it is amazing grace, isn't it? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saves a wretch like me and you and Edward. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God of grace, that the Lord Jesus Christ has shed his blood, that we might receive all the privileges of baptism and all the privileges of salvation and all the promises of God. We just pray that, Father, you would give us, give us hearts to believe this. Lord, I pray for those who are yet unrepentant. I pray, God, that you would break your gospel upon their shores today. That you would cause them to be born again. That they might, that they might believe in a new and living hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.